definitions. And the first one is about non commutative geometry fairly generally. Uh, the second one is about the Dirac operator. And the third one is about the standard model of particle physics. So, um, so I'm aiming at describing uh, an approach not to non-commutative geometry called spectral triples. And that's an approach which encapsulates a mathematical framework for the Dirac operator. And in this framework, um, it generalizes the notion of a Dirac operator to a non-commutative space. Um, what I want to explain in the third lecture is how this encapsulates the structure of the standard model. Um, and that was a very important motivating example for the construction of the whole theory. So um, I could give a lectures about non-commutative geometry and not mention the standard model, but that would be somehow missing the main point from a physicist's point of view as to what this whole development is for. Okay, so um, I have lecture notes and you will find them on the web page of the workshop and also on my own personal homepage. They will get updated from time to time. Uh, so actually, my version is slightly newer than what's on there already. Um, so they may get updated today sometime. Um, and the, the chapters in the lecture notes that correspond are um, chapters uh, 1, 2, 3, for here. And this is chapters 4, 5, 6. And the third one is chapters... 7, 8, and 11. There are some exercises in the notes. Please have a, attempt the exercises. I will uh, attempt to discuss some of the solutions of today's things in the next lecture and of these ones in, in the third lecture. And then these ones I probably won't have time for, but you can ask me about them if you want to know the solutions to these exercises. Okay, so I've set myself an impossible task to do all of this in the time I have, but uh, I shall just go quickly at various places and say, read the lecture notes for the full story. So at some points I might run out of time, but luckily you can read my notes. Okay. So, uh, the thing I want to say first is there are, when people talk about non-commutative geometry, there are a number of different ideas of what non-commutative geometry is, and it depends on what features of geometry you're trying to generalize. And so there isn't a consensus on how to do it. I'm going to do it in my own personal way, um, in the ways I like, um, but let's, some general remarks first. So, um, so if M is a manifold, say, And then we have functions C or R. Uh, and then normally you can multiply them point-wise. So you have the product function. You know this, of course. Let me just say it. Uh, and the point is that, that uh, FF prime is F prime F. So we say that the standard geometry is a commutative geometry because of this property here. So non-commutative geometry is about generalizing this to have some objects uh, abstractly that we have in our theory called, uh, which play the role of these functions, but for which this no longer commutes. So this is non-commutativity. And you're familiar with this from uh, quantum mechanics already. In quantum mechanics, we start with phase space. Phase space, which is of course commutative space. Doesn't just go off. Thank you. I'll try not to. I think it, it caught my arm. Yes, that's it. Um, uh, and then in quantum mechanics, you quantize these things. Uh, 
So we're used to this idea that in quantum mechanics you quantize functions to operators and indeed this is true. So in quantum mechanics uh, these are operators So you can think of quantum mechanics as some sort of non-commutative geometry of phase space. Um, and so what I'm interested in is developing a non-commutative geometry of a Riemannian space, of a, a uh, geometry with a metric. So instead of quantum mechanics where you have geometry with a two-form, uh, geometry with a metric. So it, it's much like quantum mechanics, uh, but it isn't quantum mechanics. Okay. So there are lots of things that are analogous to quantum mechanics, but it's, it's a distinct theory. And I like to think of it as more as a generalization of the ordinary geometry. Uh, it includes the ordinary geometry, but uh, generalizes it rather than thinking of it as quantum. Uh, that's my personal way of thinking about it. Okay. But one of the things that's common is that in quantum mechanics we know there's no precise points in phase space because of the uncertainty principle. And a similar thing happens in non-commutative geometry. Because of the non-commutation, you don't have points in the manifold. So the, the idea of a manifold as a set of points is somehow lost. So you have to be more abstract. Okay, so... Um, so what's the formalism? So we have an, an algebra. Um, and it's a vector space. And it has a multiplication law. And by default, I mean it to be associative And unital, so there's a one. Of course, there are other sorts of algebra, like Lie algebras are neither associative nor unital, but they always come qualified with a name. You say Lie algebra, not just algebra. Okay. And so in commutative geometry, Uh, you can take the algebra to be the, the functions on the manifold. So I'm going to say the smooth functions on the manifold. doesn't matter what sort of functions there are at the moment. Um, let's just say functions here. Leave that to be dis decided. And what are the points of M? Uh, they're called characters. Characters. So they're homomorphisms. So if you have a point on the manifold, then then there is a um, then there is a character so if x is in M, then there's a character theta x which sends a function to f of x and uh, that's a character because um, So in fact, it's true that um, that all uh, characters are points. So characters. So the characters. Uh, so in fact, all characters. Uh, 
are theta x for some x. So you can the point of this um, this idea is you can recover the manifold from knowing what the algebra is. Um, you just look for the characters, which are homomorphisms, um, so <coughs> and um, satisfying this property, and then you can make the set of all homomorphisms into a manifold. Um, <coughs> So now I'll say that more precisely. If you know already that you have a manifold, then you can recover the points in the manifold as the homomorphisms, as these characters. And the characters all give you the, so they give you all the points in the manifold. So you might then ask the question is, if you're just given a commutative um, algebra, what is, the, what is the space? What is the manifold? And there's a reconstruction theorem. So A with axioms. In fact, gives you a topological space. So this is Gelfand's theorem. It's the Gelfand representation theorem. And, um, <clears throat> and, and what are these axioms? Well, it's that uh, A has to be a C star algebra. And I'm not going to explain that in, in detail. Uh, I'll explain one thing about it in a minute. But this is a prototype for a sort of uh, a reconstruction theorem in, that we're going to use also in, in, uh, uh, in the smooth case. But this is sort of the weakest reconstruction theorem here, that starting with a uh, <coughs> commutative A, so this is commutative, Um, you can reconstruct a topological space. And we want to do this later with Riemannian geometry. So, so how do we start with algebras and then have some different axioms and get a Riemannian geometry here? Um, so what it means is that we can discuss the, the whole of the geometry entirely in terms of the algebra. That's the point. And then you can ask, well, okay, supposing my algebra is not commutative, then what? And then you can generalize the, the whole framework to algebras that are not necessarily commutative. And then that's your idea of non-commutative geometry. So uh, one thing I want to explain technically, because it will come up. Uh, so what does a star mean? So a star algebra. So star is a, an anti-homomorphism. Um, and so in other words, um, uh, so A, B star is B star, A star, and it's involutive. involutive. So in other words, A double star is, is A. Okay. And for, for the functions on the manifold, so if then uh, A star is, then A star is complex conjugation. And this, this, this star here means complex conjugation. Okay. 
Okay. okay. But if we have a, a more general algebra, then it's just something that satisfies these. So that's part of what you need uh, for this result. And then a C star algebra is a star algebra with some more axioms, which I'm not going to tell you about. Okay. So the simplest example. Whoa. Right. <clears throat> Slowly on that. So simplest example of a non-commutative uh, C star algebra. is the n by n matrices. So this notation is my notation for n by n matrices with complex coefficients. And then the star is um, is the Hermitian conjugate matrices. So you see, um, you could say, well, this is some sort of very weak non-commutative geometry. But it doesn't contain much information. It's, um, <coughs> is that right? I can't I actually see. see. Ah. Oh, very good. Just take it. No, there's a reason for wearing it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, right, the only information in this is, of course, the number n. So it doesn't really record much. It's some sort of non commutative topological space, but there isn't very much information in this. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> And the concept of a point is not very useful. So if we have a point, so that's a homomorphism. Then uh, any commutator and by that, I'm, of course, I mean AB minus BA is uh, That's the homomorphism property here. And then that's zero. So you see that on almost all matrices, uh, this homomorphism is, is zero. So the only, the only thing it's not um, uh, so that, that doesn't have that, that doesn't have to be zero, but that's the only you know, multiples of this matrix will be will be uh, will be determined by this. So, so, th so there's only one homomorphism on this on this uh, 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 so in fact theta of one is one. So, so uh, so uh, so the idea of points you know you just don't have. So there is no manifold anymore, no space. Um, so you might ask, well, how are we going to do geometry? Okay, so the simplest form of geometry on this non-commutative space um, is obtained by picking a differential operator. So Pick um, keep forgetting my notation. Yep, X one uh, 
in the algebra. Uh, and I want them to be anti-Hermitian, so that means the star is Um, and now I can make a differential operator, sort of a Laplace operator. And I'm going to put a minus sign in. Okay, so this is some sort of non-commutative Laplace operator. And the way you should be thinking mentally is that, um, and I'll substantiate this in a minute, is that the commutation with x, i, is like a derivative. So you can indeed see this is a sum of, of uh, second derivative terms. So, uh, so if you have a manifold in the commutative case, um, you would write the following thing. Some Laplace operator, depending on the metric, you'd write like this. plus lower order derivative terms here. And that's, uh, that's the, what you mean by the Laplace operator. Um, and so the, the key point is here that this is the, contains the information for the metric. So in fact, these are, this is you know, the inverse metric coefficients. Metric. So, so if I hand you on a manifold a Laplace operator, you can reverse engineer the metric out of it. In fact, you can you can work out what what the gij are. Therefore, take the inverse, and therefore you have the Riemannian metric. So the idea is that the same thing happens here. That given a, a non-commutative space with this operator on it here, that plays the role of the geometry for the space. And of course, that's very useful for physics because in physics, that's what we have. We have differential operators everywhere. So if we're talking about physics, we're directly talking about the things that we're interested in. So I want to pursue that a bit. Yeah, question. Yeah, so this is the non-commutative case here. You're right. If I tried to write this formula in the commutative case, I would get zero. Yes, that's right. So this, this formula here does not work in the commutative case. In the commutative case, I write this formula with derivatives. So these, so these commutators in the non-commutative case are some sort of replacement for derivatives in the commutative case. And I'm actually going to discuss in a minute how, how they're related more strongly. But, yeah. So, I'll just emphasize, this is non-commutative here, and this is commutative here. Let's see. But yes, thanks for the question. Very. Any other questions about this? Yes, you can formulate this for any example. Yes. Yes. Of course, you have to pick these, these elements, which is somewhat arbitrary, but you expect a space to have lots of geometry, so there's lots of choices of data. Okay. So I finished chapter one. Uh, 
and let's move on to chapter 2. So now I want to study an example of this. Oh, made that mistake already. So any, any other questions before I go on? They're not a basis for the algebra. They're, they're, um, they're, um, well, I'm about to do an example, and then you'll see in the example what they are. Uh, but it, at the moment, it's just some choice of some elements in the algebra. But is, is the number arbitrary? Or? It's arbitrary, yes. Yes. Yeah, finite. Arbitrary, yes. Yeah, there are all sorts of ways in which you can generalize these ideas. And you can have a non-commutative, whatever you like, geometry. And then, yes, uh, exactly. So I'm on to chapter two now. And the point is that I'm going to choose... Um, so so this, this thing that I've, called, that I've introduced here is called a fuzzy space. So, so I want to talk about fuzzy spaces with symmetry. Because it's the fastest way to get our hands on an example and compute something about it. Um, so here, there was no particular symmetry involved. I just picked some things. But what if I pick x1 to xk with some nice symmetry so that I can understand them all. Um, so particularly uh, the xi are going to generate a Lie algebra of symmetries. And, and to answer the question here, they're going to be a basis, right, uh, of the Lie algebra. So, um, so we can make, um, so now the subtle point here is that we had the algebra uh, MNC, So that's a star algebra. But I also want to make the n by n matrices into a Hilbert space. And this is a curly H, by the way, curly small h. So I'm thinking it as a vector space, but there's now an inner, pro an inner product on it. Like that. <coughs> and this is the star in the algebra, which is uh, star as emission conjugation, as before. OK. All right. And then you can calculate, for example, um, the adjoint of an operator. So, so we have an operator, which I'm going to call um, rho of x. And this is an operator on the Hilbert space. OK, so this x comma dot means take the commutator with x. So what's the adjoint of this? Calculation. Uh, 
going to run out of space, of course. So I'm just going to unfold all the definitions here, just to prove that there's no magic involved. And after a bit of algebra, you see that's trace of So it says the adjoint of the operator rho is uh, rho of x star. So adjoint of a rho of x, the adjoint is rho of x star. So star is doing lots of work here in different guises. Uh, rho of x is an operator on Hilbert space, so this means the adjoint on Hilbert space. And this is the star in the algebra. Okay. So. So my choice of x in the, this previous uh, in this example here, I made them anti-hermitian. So for uh, anti-hermitian x, which means x star is minus x, then this result here is that um, minus so if you think of, of x as uh, or as the row gadget here as differentiation in the sort of x direction then this this is sort of integration by parts non-commutative version of that. And, um, and it follows, therefore, that delta is, is a Hermitian operator. Operator on this Hilbert space. So you see here now I'm, I'm continuing this idea of using the matrices in two different guises. First it's an algebra and secondly it's, it's things that you act on with the differential operator and that's the Hilbert space. So thinking of this operator as acting on the Hilbert space, it's a Hermitian operator. And in fact you can also show that it's positive. That by just using the integration by parts lemma on, on one, one factor onto the other side, and then it's obviously positive. That's in the notes. Okay, so another thing I want to say about this. Um, so rho of x... Uh, for x in the Lie algebra of a group acting in in the Hilbert space uh, is a representation of well, huh, right. 
I've, I've gone too fast here. Let, let's start again. So, so I'm going to pick. Um, okay. So, so pick a Lie group. So Lie group. G with a unitary representation, so a real Lie group with unitary representation <coughs> on C N. And so uh, and let x, uh, so pick a basis, uh, well, uh, let x be what I want to say here. Um, The, the representation presentation of a Lie algebra element element on C N. In other words, X is a X is a an N by N matrix. I'm just just trying to avoid introducing lots of extra notation. So it's in the Lie algebra, but I also want it to be a matrix, an N by N matrix. Okay, so okay, and then so the point is that um, this makes C N a representation of of the Lie algebra, but so is uh, is the Hilbert space. Also, is a representation of the Lie algebra with rho of x equals x commutator. And um, and you can think of this as isomorphic to uh, C n tends to the dual space. <coughs> and then this representation here is the is the defining representation tensor with the the dual representation equals. I'm regretting not having notation for this equals. Uh, well, CN tensor dual CN as a representation. Oh, feeling I've said that badly. So if, if G is in the Lie group, uh, then G uh, acts on the Hilbert space by Okay, so I'm thinking of this group as sitting in 
uh, in uh, well in the unitary group of n by n, of n by n matrices. So this is multiplying matrices here. And so the Lie algebra, so x in the Lie algebra, you you linearize here. You write you write uh, you, know, you write uh, g is x of x and linearize. So you just take the linear the linear term, and then the action is x goes to. Okay, which is writing as the commutator and or this row notation. I hope that's reasonably clear as to what I mean by everything. There's more details in the notes. It's perhaps explained more clearly in the notes. Okay, you plug this in here and just take the linear term and you get this. So my simple example is going to be the sphere. So um, the group is SU2. And x1, x2, and x3 generate the Lie algebra. These are the standard generators. And then you can write the um, the plus operator, which I had here on this board. And of course, this is just applying the row action twice. And this is the quadratic Casimir operator. Or the total angular momentum. If you're a physicist, or the representation of G on H, if you're a mathematician, defined this way. So we know lots about the uh, Casimir operator or angular momentum operator. Um, <clears throat> so let's write that here. So in particular, the Hilbert space, which is MNC, is C to the N tenths of the dual space. But in SU2, um, dual representations are isomorphic to representations on CN, so this is isomorphic because it's SU2.
Okay, it's because each space CN has on it an invariant inner product, and the invariant inner product provides the isomorphism between CN and CN star, so you can identify them. Okay. And then we know the uh, klebsch gordon series for this as representations you have So uh, a, a tip, typical sum end here, C, uh, ah, I don't have a notation for that. Well, so spin J has a uh, representation on C to two J plus one and the Casimir operator has eigenvalue J J plus one. So I can translate that into, into these integers here by writing this as CK, if you like, and then solving for K in terms of J, and then you see what, what the eigenvalue of the pass operator is on each of these subspaces. So I've got a little table here. Um, so the eigenvalues um, is... Uh, Starts at zero, two, six, and so on, up to and the multiplicity, which is so what's the multiplicity? Oh, the multiplicity is two j plus one, which is. And the spin, this is what I call j, this is 2j plus 1. This is j. So it's the even spins that appear, or the integer spins that appear. So not every representation appears, just the ones that appear in this decomposition. So it's a little table of eigenvalues, a little plus operator. So any questions about this computation? So the unique phrase here is you have two operators for the negative term and the plus spin. So in this case, you have both n and k. So is there like a kind of level of n? Yes, so, so these, so, each, yes, so in fact, uh, rho of x3 would be the m operator. Yes, that's right. And of course, you have a de degeneracy here, so each, uh, each irreducible here uh, has, is degenerate with, well, yeah, so, so on C3, there's three things with the same eigenvalue, yeah. But they're distinguished by the eigenvalues of m, exactly. Any other question? Yep, so where am I up to?
I just mentioned here, it's rather nice to think about the, what the eigenvectors look like. So that follows on nicely from your question. So I'm going to do a simple, simple example. So three by three matrices. Like that. And the numbers add up, of course. Um, and you might ask, well, how do I actually write these spaces as matrices? So you can use the, the weight basis, as, as you mentioned, with a, it's called M. That's not supposed to happen. No, thank you. Turn it off. Use the mute. Um, so what does C1 look like? Well, <coughs> thinking of this as a matrix, um, the matrices of the form, let's not bother with the brackets, They're just multiples of the identity matrix, so A and C. And obviously they have eigenvalue zero because that commutes with everything, so you get, that's the eigenvalue zero here, multiplicity one. Uh, and what's C3? their matrices of this form. So there are three parameters here, B, C, D. And C5 is, is what's left. Which you can also write in formula four, but I'm not going to bother. And the interesting thing about these matrices um, is that they they sort of there's sort of an expanding diagonal going on here. That that this thing here lies entirely on the diagonal, and this matrix is near the diagonal. And this one here is everything. And if you do bigger examples, um, this pattern persists. If you have you know, 10 by 10 matrices, you find that this first one is the diagonal, and this one is near the diagonal, and this, this thing widens as you go down. So there's a very interesting thing about this, that this differential operator here, it's selected out um, we've got these eigenvalues here, but also when we look at the eigenvectors, um, the ones that correspond to the low eigenvalues kind of almost commute in the sense that their matrix elements are fairly near the diagonal. So actually if you calculate the commutator, you find that the commutator is relatively small in a sense because, because the entries don't stray too far away from the diagonal. So you see a sense in, in which uh, the low energy parts of this 
Hilbert space um, have um, some characteristics of being fairly commutative, if you like, whereas when you go to high energies, it becomes very non-commutative. So, what to say? So you can actually uh, vary this. So, for example, a, a cheap thing to do would be to put in numerical coefficients here. You could put in sort of alpha, beta, and gamma in front of these, and you could make yourself a whole family of operators here in which you would no longer have a sort of symmetric geometry, because this, of course, is invariant under the action of the group. But if I put in coefficients, it's not anymore. And then you particularly, you break this degeneracy uh, of the, um, this multiplicity will be broken. And you can actually, so there's an exercise in the notes to calculate an example of, of this. So, so there is this distinguished operator here, which is highly symmetric, but also you can make other ones fairly easily on this space. And they correspond to other geometries on this non-commutative space. How am I doing? Yeah. Whew. Any questions? Yeah. Right, so. <laughs> yes, good, thank you. Yes. Um, so, this construction is due to Jens Hopper and John Medor. It's called the Fuzzy Sphere, back from 1980, whenever. Um, and you can also understand it in terms of geometric quantization of uh, the co joint orbit, which is the two sphere. Um, so yes, uh, it has a lot to do with quantization in that sense, so, yes. So it, it's very analogous to quantization. Yeah, so, so there's an interesting question as to how to write, in general, how to write this, this isomorphism here in this form, and, uh, and using this ge geometric quantization as a way of doing it, yes. So in fact, nothing I've said here is specific to SU2. You can do this for other Lie groups, and then you have the geometric quantization of the co-joint orbit coming in to the construction. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so I'm on to the last chapter of my notes. So I feel like I should take a quick break of like 60 seconds or something, and then I'll come back.
Just really touch. Yes. Let me try a better fix. So, just uh, pull a bit uh, your the string. Yes. Yes. Right. So I put it inside. Yeah. Time. Okay. Very good. Okay. Is that good? Okay. Let, let's see when. No. So let's just. Let me, yeah, you, you do it? Yeah. This way should be. Okay. Sorry? Are you able to print uh, I did manage to print, thank you, yes. Okay, so my last um, chapter for now is called Commutative Analogues. So I discussed this gadget here called the Fuzzy Sphere. And now I want to discuss the Ordinary Sphere and compare them. So... <coughs> Yep, so we have the ordinary sphere, which I'm going to think of as sitting in R3. Um, with R1 plus R2 plus R3 all squared. Oops, three equals one. And then the, the functions on the sphere form uh, a Hilbert space, which I'm going to call curly H infinity. So the L2 functions on the sphere. So that's obviously a representation space for the action of uh, SU2. <coughs> And there's a standard decomposition of this in, uh, into the harmonics. And now I'm going to write 2j plus 1. So this is, uh, these are called spherical harmonics. So every integer spin appears once, but the not half integer ones don't appear. So it's like very much like uh, something that I've yeah very much like this decomposition. It's exactly this, except in this case this truncates, and in the sphere case it continues up to infinity. So like fuzzy sphere. If it goes to infinity. Okay, the upper limit, it you just be n here for the fuzzy sphere. So um, so this means there's an inclusion of the fuzzy sphere. Hilbert space 
into, into the ordinary sphere, Hilbert space. And I've described this up to some uh, scalar on each irreducible representation, obviously. But you can actually fix that scalar. And it's an interesting problem, as I think we were saying earlier, about you can actually solve using co-joint orbits to fix an exact map from one to the other. So in that sense, the, the ordinary sphere is a sort of a commutative analogue of the fuzzy sphere. That's the point I want to make. And I want to try and make this more precise. So back to the ordinary sphere here. Um, so this is sort of a remark in parenthesis here. Um, <clears throat> of course, if I differentiate the, so there's an SU, SU2 action. Uh, and if I differentiate this action, I get the Lie, uh, the Lie algebra acting on the sphere. And then the Lie algebra acts by vector fields. So, you know, V1 equals and similar formulas for V2 and V3. And then, of course, you know, you have the standard thing that commutator of V1 and V2 is V3, etc. Where am I going? Yes, here. So the Laplace operator on the sphere, which I'm going to write with an infinity on it, is in fact uh, this operator. So there's a bit of a calculation with those drifters, but indeed that's what it comes out to be. So this is also the Casimir operator. So again, it's just determined by the spin of the irreducible representations in the spherical harmonics. So you get the same uh, table, which I've rubbed out, of course, uh, of eigenvalues that I wrote down before, except there's no upper limit. It just carries on all the way up to infinity. Same table of eigenvalues. Except it's now upper limit. No, upper limit. On N. Uh, my chalk's got too short. So the question is, uh, why is the commutator a good analog of the derivative in this case? Okay, so this, this derivative here 
appears to be an analogue of the commutator with x1 as our head in there. So y uh, v1 is analogue of x1 in the non-commutative case. The other way around. So th the answer is kind of very general. Um, that if you have an algebraic framework, if you have a homomorphism, of algebras. Um, this maps a, um, a character theta of A to theta prime of A prime by this following thing that um, so theta prime like that. So I should call that A prime. Okay, so this maps you back to A, and then you do the character in A. And because both uh, phi and theta are homomorphisms, the product thing is a homomorphism, so it's a character. So in the commutative case, you can reformulate a, a mapping of spaces um, M to M prime as a homomorphism backwards from A prime to A. So this is commutative case. This is in the commutative case. So normally in the commutative case, you just say points go to points, but you can say, aha, I can reformulate that as a homomorphism of the algebra backwards, and then that maps points to points. So now when we come to the non-commutative case, we just say we look for a homomorphism. So um, what that means is, um, <clears throat> let's rub this one out. So in the non-commutative case, or in generally, a vector field is an infinitesimal homomorphism of A to itself, i.e. a derivation. OK. 
Okay, so it satisfies the Leibniz rule. So the non-commutative case that I discussed previously was matrices. So let's, I'm going to rub this out and say in the matrix case. Non-commutative matrix case. So why why do derivations end up at well? Okay, so there's a um, standard result for matrices for. If the algebra is n by n matrices, the, you have the skolem nerta theorem. It says that any automorphism is a conjugation. Uh, any. Uh, automorphism is for some invertible matrix. So obviously in the case uh, u is x of x and again you linearize you find that the derivation is is the commutator x a So X, obviously, and here X should be anti-emission. Okay, to make this unitary. So this idea that, um, that vector fields correspond to uh, commutators is very much to do with uh, matrices, and it's particular to this this matrix algebra. You see, the point is the n by the, the full matrix algebra of all n by n matrices is somehow maximally non-commutative. So there are no points in this. I mean, obviously, you can have uh, intermediate cases. You can have sub subalgebras of this algebra matrices, and then skolem nerta is not true. So some of the uh, some of the vector fields would be commutators like this, but others wouldn't be. So, for example, if I took a commutative subalgebra of matrices, then there wouldn't be any commutators, so that would be boring. So that's an extreme case where you would not get anything interesting in this way. Okay. But in our fuzzy spaces, this is, this is, uh, this is the reason why we're looking at commutators. So, I haven't done this board right. Right, so. How am I doing? Yep. Yeah. 
So a novel feature of the fuzzy space is that H has two actions. Of, um, of the algebra. And I'm now talking about matrices. So, so there's that action and there's the other one. So you can multiply by matrices on the left or on the right. And in fact, there's two actions. If I have a symmetry group, if I have the group, group G, So if G is, is, in the, is, is in the algebra, then of course that means I have an action of G cross G. So if I have an element G in that and H in that one, I can act with G on the left and H inverse on the right, and that makes this a left action of this of this product group. Left, can't spell. And similarly, there's a an action of the product of the two Lie algebras. So I act with x on the left and minus y on the right. Okay, linearizing the inverse to minus sign. So we already used the diagonal action. Diagonal action used. Used for uh, mappings, or mappings. Vector fields. So the diagonal action was uh, G Psi G inverse, or X Psi minus for the infinitesimal version. So this is with uh, H equals G. Or y equals x. Okay, so I've just been talking about these. So it leaves me some more space. What about the anti diagonal action? Well, it's not an action, but I've still got the anti diagonal. I feel like I've just rubbed out the wrong board, never mind. <laughs> So x is minus y. How does this look? So I'm going to call this capital R. Not 
much of a like this notation. Well, oh, okay, I'll change it if I need to. I'm also going to write as a sort of curly bracket anti commutator notation. And I want to contrast this to the thing I previously called rho, but I'm now going to call v for some unknown reason. Which is the commutator. Right, and I can, I can, uh, and in the the context of the fuzzy sphere, I had three of these. So, so if I have the, this is very general, but if I have the fuzzy sphere, then. and have an index here, which I've written as L. So L equals one, two, or three. So I want to bring the discussion down to looking at the fuzzy sphere. Treating this as an example, which my notes actually don't say specialized to sphere. So there's a few relations you can you can prove. So I think this is an exercise. Yep. And again, this is actually general, but I've, I've, um, I'm thinking here of the fuzzy sphere as an example. So this combination of these operators here is in fact the anti-commutator with, with a squared operator. And this combination of operators As a commutator with a squared operator. So that's exercise four for your homework. So now I'm going to sum over the L's from one to three. It's no longer the exercise, but Didn't leave myself enough space, did I? Okay, but this combination here of operators is the Casimir operator on CN. It 
times the unit matrix. So it's the Casimir on C N. So this is very much for the fuzzy sphere. So since this is the unit matrix here, this is zero. And this is the anti-commutator with a, with a constant. So this is uh, this is not too hard to work out. This is uh, n squared minus one times the unit operator on the whole Hilbert space. This thing here, this sum of these things, this is our Laplace operator that we like. So this is giving us some, where am I going? This one probably. That one. Feels like nearly lunchtime. So I'm nearly at the punchline, you'll be pleased to know. Right, so I'm just going to copy these over. So the first one thing is the Laplace operator. with a minus sign, right, so I need to negate it all. So presumably there's a minus sign missing from here. That was the same. So recall that we had a map of representations So in actual fact um, As we saw, the spectrum of the Laplace operator on the sphere is just the cutoff version of the Laplace operator on the fuzzy space. So if I map into the sphere and do the Laplace operator, that's the same as doing the fuzzy one and mapping into the sphere. So in fact, you can write Think of one as the limit of the other. I mean, as operators in in L two the sphere. And what I mean by this is, is point-wise, i.e. for any
this is known as pointwise convergence in Hilbert space or strong operator convergence, whatever you like. So basically, if you want to compute the ordinary Laplacian of some harmonic, it's good enough to compute. Well, if you start with something that's in the, the fuzzy sphere, it will have a certain list of harmonics. And obviously, um, if I inject that into the, this Hilbert space, I get the same thing when I apply the, the plus operator to it. Or conversely, if I start with something in the Hilbert space of here, it will have some harmonics that are above the cutoff and the fuzzy sphere. So these two things won't be exactly equal, but as I make n get larger and larger, more and more of the harmonics will, will sit inside the ones on the fuzzy sphere, and then the, uh, the difference in the operators will get less and less. So, so for any, yeah, so, so for any uh, element of L2, any function on the sphere, eventually all of its harmonics, except for epsilon, will become in the range of the fuzzy sphere and then the Laplace operators will agree. I hope that makes sense. That's, that's roughly the idea of the proof. Okay, uh, <clears throat> but then if I look at this, this equation here, I need to rescale by, um, by one over n squared to make sense of it. And then you see that this thing here will converge to zero. And in fact, because it's lunchtime, I'm just going to... So what, what you find is that, is that uh, 1 over n RL converges nicely to some uh, operator on, uh, on the Hilbert space, the the infinite Hilbert space. And this, of course, converges to the unit operator on H. Uh -huh. So what is this equation that you get? Um, you get... Uh, there's an I in this formula here, right? So you get that this equation becomes um, sum of Ri squared is one. And this equation here becomes sum of Ri the I equals naught. So what does that tell you? It tells you that here you have a sphere. These are the coordinates on the sphere. And here it tells you the tangent space is two-dimensional. Okay, the, if you have three vector fields on the sphere, there's one linear relation between them. What is it? It's this. Okay, so I've run out of... Uh, things to say and time. That's my uh, fuzzy spaces introduction to non commutativity and the how they correspond to commutative spaces. So, any last question before we all go and have lunch? More details in the notes. Okay, thank you everybody. Okay.